How many people? How many people did his, did he say, Andy? I don't. Uh, and we had like 125 on the list. That's pretty good. Yeah. Was that about the same as last time? Uh, I don't remember. Probably, yeah. So you're gonna tell us when we're started? Yeah, I think Nick just sent a Skype message saying we're live, yeah. but we're gonna wait a few minutes here. We're on. We're on. Yeah. Okay. Sounds like we're on. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us for this uh, webinar about uh, sport, NFTs and sports. What's the game plan? Um, my name's Andy Lee, uh, and I have with me uh, my colleague Jose Lazaro, who is at uh, Foley and Lardner. And uh, we practice in our uh, Dawn practice group, which is digital assets. Web3 and NFTs, as well as our sports and entertainment group. Um, we have a, a, a really robust practice in, in both of those areas. It's always made a lot of sense to uh, do this webinar now, uh, talk about uh, sort of the, the overlap between those two areas. And, you know, in particular, I, I think it's a, it's a good time for this because with what's going on in, in the crypto space, uh, you know, over the last you know, six to, to 12 months, really, most recently being in what uh, sort of crypto winter in, in the industry. Um, another way of, of just calling it a bear, uh, bear market. But, you know, the reality is that um, we feel this is a really uh, interesting and exciting time in this space, despite uh, the, the state of the market for cryptocurrency, because the 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 infrastructure that this this technology represents, whether you think about it as crypto, blockchain, or NFTs, it really is a very new uh, type of technology and a new um, way for brands and sports property consumers and for people to interact with each other uh, in the digital space. And we're seeing a lot of activity in the space from the technology perspective, including building and, and new services and new applications and new ideas that are going to be coming into play, some of which we'll talk about today, but most or all of which really are going to happen regardless of whether the price of Bitcoin is, you know, 30,000 or, or 15,000 or whether the price of Ethereum is 1,500 or 10,000. People are still building with this technology. It really is a kind of a game changer. And it's um, and, and the, the world of sports is a particularly ripe area technology to be important and, and disruptive uh, for among other reasons because the brands are so strong in sports um, the the attention of, of the public is is so focused uh, on sports and because a lot of many if not all sports properties have very sort of active and um, uh, you know identifiable communities of, of fans that that are really in there so um, we're going to talk uh, a little bit about that. Um, I, I'm going to so so my like I said, my name's Andy Lee. I've been a sports lawyer for many many years and a technologist and technology lawyer as well. Uh, I was the general counsel of the New York Jets um, before uh, going back into private practice. I was also the general counsel of uh, the New York New Jersey Super Bowl host committee. And I've been in this space for a while. I'll let uh, Jose take a minute to introduce himself, and while he does that. I'm going to launch a little poll here that I want people to share some thoughts about as we begin our discussion. Yeah, uh, so hi, hi all. Thank you for joining us today. My name, as Andy said, is Jose Lazaro. Uh, I am part of our transactions practice group here at Foley. I do uh, quite a bit of work in the NFT and more general crypto and blockchain space. Uh, my practice also consists of mergers and acquisitions, public company work and securities work. Uh, Having played sports my whole life, uh, happy to be here talking sports and NFTs with you today. Thanks, Jose. Um, yeah, so if everyone can uh, take just take a minute to, we just put up a poll uh, that asks you for what word or phrase comes to mind when you think of sports NFTs. Uh, it's going to create a little um, a word cloud for us uh, that I thought might be interesting just to get uh, people's perspective on. Um, I'll leave that up for for just a minute while uh, uh, Jose talks. Uh, generally about um, the background of what an NFT is. Why don't you go ahead, Jose? Are you going to do just one poll right now? Yeah, we're just going to do the one poll. We'll let it keep running okay. for a couple of minutes. Sure. Uh, so as some of you may know, uh, the, the term NFT stands for non-fungible tokens. Uh, NFTs are unique 
indivisible digital assets that sort of represent ownership of a particular item or a piece of content. This can include a uh, digital artwork, music, video, or, e or even something like just a tweet. Um, unlike fungible tokens like Bitcoin and Ethereum, which are uh, interchangeable and have the same value, uh, each NFT has its own distinct uh, value and characteristics. An easy way to think about this non-fungible aspects of NFTs is, for example, you cannot take a, let's say, Board Ape Yacht Club NFT and pass it as a Doodles NFT or any other NFT for that matter, because the characteristics of your NFT as stored on the blockchain are, are different and immutable from any other NFT. Um, same slide, right? Andy? Yeah. Uh, later on in this presentation, we're going to touch on some of the sports related use cases of NFTs. But here, I'd like to just touch on the fact that the use cases that we're seeing for NFTs are moving at an extremely rapid pace. Uh, less than two years ago, less than two years ago, excuse me, NFTs mostly served uh, for use as profile pictures on different online social media platforms like Discord, Twitter. Uh, some people still use them on Instagram. Uh, but today we're seeing some advanced use cases for for NFTs. Uh, one example here is token gating. Uh, I'll touch about about this one a, a bit later. But uh, one example here, um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the music festival Rolling Loud. It's a uh, hip hop uh, music festival, and they just released their NFT collection where the person who holds the NFT can um, has lifetime access to the NFT. So we're seeing advanced use cases such as this one. Uh, additionally, some brands are some big brands are being born out of NFTs and the, the underlying tokens, those underlying NFTs are being used to sort of decentralize the IP ownership of such brands. Uh, so I just wanted to you know, get that across that NFTs, while most people see them as profile pictures or expensive monkey pictures, uh, you know, the, the use cases are vast and they're expanding at a rapid pace. Uh, and that's just scratching the surface of some of the stuff that's being built. Thanks, Jose. Um, talk a little bit. Well, can, can you guys, Jose, can you see the, uh, the results of the poll up there on the screen? Or is it just me? Um, I can't see them right now. Okay. Well, Nick, maybe you can figure out a way to, to display them. Uh, sport results. Um, okay. So if we can get those up, we will, but in the meantime, uh, we're going to, we're going to talk pretty uh, briefly about some of the basics, um, of the technology before we get into legal issues and, um, and use cases. Uh, so blo the, a blockchain. Uh, this this new technology is basically a distributed ledger uh, that is kind of like a, a computer system, an operating system that is spread out over a number of different computers or nodes. So it's it's distributed so that um, you know decisions and and transactions and things that happen are not happening just on one uh, one computer terminal, but they have it has to be agreed upon by um, a series or a collection of the nodes in this in, in the blockchain. Uh, which is which is what gives it part of its um, its security and its reliability because no one person can control or change any particular transaction. Uh, so that that aspect of it is decentralized. You hear a lot about decentralization in this space, uh, and it's it's a similar concept to the the technical piece of being a dis distributed ledger. The decision making and the authority is is decentralized, meaning it doesn't rest with any one centralized authority uh, in the way that uh, sort of our web two uh, systems and even even prior um, that we're used to when you you know when you uh, do your online banking and you go to your online bank that you know your bank is controlling it or uh, when you're interacting on Instagram or Facebook that that company is is controlling that that network um, blockchain works differently because it's fully decentralized uh, and the things that happen on the blockchain uh, are confirmed by what's called a consensus mechanism. Um, and there are two types of main, con con there are several types of consensus mechanisms, but the main ones are proof of work and proof of stake. A proof of work consensus me mechanism in that, in that model, the nodes, which are the, the terminals that we just, we just talked about, uh, they compete with each other to solve a complex math problem. And the first one to solve it uh, confirms a, a block of transactions on the blockchain. Uh, and gets rewarded with tokens. So Bitcoin is is sort of the, the most famous example of that. Um, there is 
there, there are benefits to it in that it's it's very secure and stable because the amount of energy that it would take to override the validation of a transaction or to to change or 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 hack a transaction that's being confirmed by all of these different nodes is is prohibitive. The the downside of it is, which is one of the big um, criticisms of, of crypto over the years, has been this this very huge energy consumption. Uh, it, it it it's the the, the worldwide mining uh, of Bitcoin, for example, continues to to use a lot of a lot of energy that gets um, a lot of heat from uh, environmentalists for for good reason. Ethereum, which is the main network uh, where the main blockchain uh, or most popular blockchain for NFTs, recently changed from proof of work to a proof of stake uh, consensus mechanism. And as a result, its energy consumption went down by 99.98%. So in this little uh, uh, graphic here, you can see it, it would be the equivalent of, you know, going something going from the size of the Eiffel Tower to the size of a tiny little uh, Lego man. Uh, and in proof of stake, rather than solving a math problem, uh, validators, they stake their own tokens on Ethereum. It would be it would be ETH. Um, and in order to get a chance to validate a transaction and the more they stake and the longer they've had it staked, the greater chance they have of validating the transaction. It's very en energy efficient. And if for some reason they they um, they they validate a bad transaction or do something wrong, they they would be slashed. Basically, they would lose that ETH, and that's that's where the reliability of that comes in. Um, Jose, you want to over to you for public and private? Yeah, uh, thanks, Andy. The the idea of private and public blockchains it's simple in theory, really. Uh, some blockchains are designed to be public, with all transactions being validated and viewable publicly, whereas on the private side. A business, for example, might want to implement uh, blockchain technology for some aspects of their business, uh, but for obvious reasons, they they wouldn't want that information to be public. Thus, they would implement uh, private blockchain technology as needed for their business, which would es essentially operate as a as, as a closed system. So that's sort of the difference. You can have either or depending on what kind of um, solution you're trying to implement. And then uh, on layer one versus layer two blockchains uh when it comes to layer one l1 blockchains some of the main examples include ethereum uh avalanche solana binance smart chain uh there's others as well uh but l1 blockchains are are their main blockchain networks that are in charge of reviewing validating and executing online on-chain transactions excuse me uh, on the other hand, we have these L2 blockchains, we, which are more recent, recent in nature. Uh, these are uh, blockchains that are built on top of L1 blockchains. Uh, L2 blockchains essentially uh, they piggyback off the security of an L1 blockchain, and they process transactions in bundles. Uh, and this has a number of benefits, including helping to scale the network, uh, reducing network congestion and gas fees, and and some other benefits as well. Uh, some examples of L2 blockchains include um, Arbitrum, Optimism, and the other very popular one right now is Polygon. Um, so that that covers L1 and L2 blockchains. Yeah, and I, I would add there, there's something that you hear about in particularly in in layer twos. And I talked earlier about how there's a lot of building going on in this space. A lot of that is happening at this la layer two level, and that includes not just the layer twos, but then building what are called dApps or dApps, decentralized applications, which run on on the blockchain, uh, often on the layer two, because it's, it's very efficient to do that. And so that's where we're going to start to see um, in the coming uh, months and years, a lot of these actual um, uh, applications or, or newer different ways of, of doing things um, on the blockchain. Which brings us to token standards. Did the slide switch on your side, Andy? It's not showing for me. Yeah. Oh, here we go. Um, yeah, so token standards as set forth here in, in the slide, uh, they essentially uh, can be described as the set of, set of agreed upon rules that govern the design, development, behavior, and operation of a specific cryptocurrency asset on a given blockchain protocol. Um, as we have noted here in the slides, there there's several standards worth discussing here, and all of them are based on Ethereum. Uh, the first of these being ERC-20. Uh, ERC-20 is the usual standard on Ethereum. It is the fungible token standard, and it is used to produce tokens on the Ethereum network. Uh, as we noted previously, uh, fungible tokens include, you know, 
the main cryptocurrencies such as Ethereum, uh, others as well. Um, second standard being ERC721. ERC721 is the basic standard that's used for NFTs, and it is used to represent uh, unique ownership of these non-fungible tokens. Uh, ERC721 is more complex than ERC20, and uh, it is used by some of the most notable NFT collections out there, including the Board Ape Yacht Club, uh, CryptoPunks, and, and many others. Uh, third, ERC-1155, which has been growing in popular popularity lately. Uh, it's another popular NFT token standard, and it has certain benefits against ERC-721. For example, ERC-1155 reduces network congestion, can lower gas costs by up to 90%. Um, you know, another difference between these standards is that 721 only supports the creation of NFTs, while 1155 uh, it not only supports the creation of NFTs, but also the creation of fungible and semi-fungible tokens, which can facilitate the conversion of fungible and non-fungible tokens into NFTs and vice versa. Here, we've seen uh, many NFT project, projects sort of gam gamify their experience, where, where first people will mint a semi-fungible or fungible token, and then um, a week later, uh, turn that in and mint the actual NFT. So it, it sort of, you know, allows NFT projects to be a bit creative in how they release their collections. And lastly, uh, ERC-4337. This is the, later, the latest ERC standard that's been deployed on Ethereum. I think it was deployed, Andy, correct me if I'm wrong, less than a week ago. Um, yeah. Yeah, and, and this standard is known as the account abstraction standard. Uh, this is seen as a, a key feature that could make it easier for users to recover lost funds, as access and accessible wallets, and Overall, we think uh, ERC-4337 can reduce the friction that currently exists uh, to onboard new users, uh, millions of new users into the crypto space. Andy, I don't know, I, I think you have something You have something else to add on 4337? Yeah, I think, and I, I haven't really you know, dug into the, the technicalities of it, but from a, a, a big picture perspective, you know, anytime there's a new technology like this, and we've seen it with, in, in lots of other examples, uh, it, you know, if it's if it's highly technical at the beginning, it's difficult to get into. Um, it can be scary for people. Uh, people can make mistakes. People can, uh, in in cases of of token uh, crypto wallets, lose money, get hacked, things like that, and that creates uh, resistance or, as Jose said, friction to getting people into the space. Um, the part of the idea here of ERC forty three thirty seven is to take the experience to a place where I think it ultimately will be. Um, in a number of years where we will be in our daily lives interacting and, and doing things in, in a way that is relying on NFTs, for example, and blockchain transactions without even realizing that it's happening yet. So that's that's the, the concept there of making this, uh, getting this to the point where it will be more ubiquitous and that as the, the technology around it develops and, and standards like this make it make it easier and more seamless uh, that it will uh, raise the degree to which this technology underlies uh, a normal part of just our part of our everyday lives, much in the way that like our mobile phones uh, do now. And, um, you know, there's a lot that that has gone into that technology over the last 10 or 15 years to make it so easy for us to be uh, doing things like, um, I don't know, micropayments with our phone or, you know, I get on the subway just by tapping my phone right now. And there's a lot of technology going on in there that we sort of start to take for granted. Um, this account abstraction concept is, is uh, one step in the direction of trying to get to that place with blockchain and NFTs. Um, so uh, that's kind of a very quick, you know, general overview of the technology, uh, but we wanted to definitely talk about uh, as well the some of the legal considerations that go into, in particular, NFT projects. Uh, and we've listed here some, some of the main, some some of the primary ones. You know, not there there are obviously others as well, but um, intellectual property is is a very important part of this, right? Because part of um, an NFT, most if not all NFTs, have some visual component to them, whether it's a a PFP or profile picture, some some work of art, some image that the NFT represents. And when you when you look at your NFT, sometimes it could be a video or it could be it could be an audio file. But when you look at your NFT in your 
in your wallet or in your OpenSea account, what you see uh, is is some visual representation of the NFT. The, N the NFT itself, of course, is is really you know a line or series of lines of codes. It, it it's represented by a smart contract that is really just a computer program, but it typically either incorporates or is linked to uh, a uh, an image or some other file that is stored on the decentralized network. Um, and anytime you're doing that, you have to think about intellectual property rights. So you know there are there are art artist issues you know who created the art that is in the nft and who actually owns that um there are trademark issues um uh, if if you have an nft that uh is is using or is looking like um a, a trademark or product of someone else's in the real world a good um example of that recently is the the case in which um uh the the rothschild uh Hermes case over um where there was a lawsuit over NFTs that depict, depicted what were called uh, meta Birkin bags, uh, which were sort of digital versions of um, of, uh, of of Hermes's uh, Birkin bags. Hermes sued the the artist who did that, and there was a, a a big First Amendment issue in in that case having to do with whether this was. Um, uh, a, a, a fair use or a creative uh, uh, First Amendment use under Rogers versus Grimaldi, a Supreme Court case that allows for that. Um, and the case actually went to trial and, and Hermes won the case and, and the jury found that the artist had had infringed Hermes's trademark. So you do have to be aware of that. Um, uh, there's important concepts like, you know, making sure if 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 you are launching an NFT project, as an entity, um, making sure that any any independent contractors that you bring in to work on that, particularly with respect to the art and the and the programming code, um, are appropriately documented with work for hire agreements, so that your entity owns it in the first place. Uh, we're seeing a lot of trademark registrations relating to use use of marks in the metaverse. That's a it's it's a very hot area right now in terms of trademark filings. Um, there are new batches of domain names out there now that are blockchain specific domain domain names like .eth, .io, uh, and it's a whole new segment of that sort of category of, of intellectual property consisting of domain names. Um, there are patent issues as well. Uh, you know, patent lawyers are uh, evaluating and filing um, uh, patents having to do with uh, processes that that happen using blockchain technology. Um, and finally, of course, we uh, uh, are also seeing a lot in this in this area, particularly in the sports space, relating relating to name, image, and likeness. Right. So, um, in particular, with respect to to uh, uh, college athletes who are now able to monetize their name, image, and likeness, um, right around the same time, here come NFTs, which are kind of a perfect way to do things like launch digital trading cards and other types of collectibles that would allow for uh, the athletes to um, to to earn some money or make a make some some uh, uh, some earnings based on the licensing or use of their name, image, and likeness uh, in a way that is new and different from simply doing a sponsorship, you know, with a local restaurant or something like that. In the NIL space, there are there are uh, state specific laws uh, that you have to be aware of. So depending on what state the athlete is in. Um, and also university specific rules. So depending on what university the athlete goes to, you do have to check off and make sure that whatever you're doing complies with, with all of those rules. Um, another area to be concerned about with um, uh, NFT projects, particularly in the sports space, where, where we've seen a lot of consumer fraud and consumer protection lawsuits um, in the context of, of ticketing situations, personal seat licenses, um, uh, or you know changes to uh, season, season ticket issues. There, it's a very ripe area for uh, class action plaintiffs' lawyers um, to decide to uh, file a lawsuit in the hopes of forcing some kind of a settlement, even if it's not a very strong case, because class actions are very difficult uh, uh, and expensive uh, to litigate, and and because consumer fraud and consumer protection statutes often have statutory damages components to them. So, um, you know, if you have, I don't know, 40,000 potential fans on a season ticket 
list and there's statutory damages of $500, you know, per fan, even without proving any damages, that's a pretty, can be a pretty uh, 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 decent payday for a plaintiff's lawyer. So you do have to be very careful um, about uh, respecting and, and, and uh, complying with those rules as well. Um, Jose, you want to talk about AML? Um, AML or Howie? Sorry, on the, my slides are. Oh well, okay. We're. Or, oh, sorry. I, I can on. talk. I can talk AML and KYC. Um, so AML and KYC stands for uh, anti money laundering and know your customer. Uh, these are guidelines and regulations that apply to certain industries, and including, uh, including, excuse me, some major sectors of the financial services industry. Uh, what we have seen here is that some traditional companies, some Web2 quote unquote companies joining the NFT space and the more general crypto space are actually implementing some AML KYC features to their products. Um, we see this as a sort of way for these uh, companies to shield themselves from being accused of facilitating money laundering or, or other illegal activities, which unfortunately the, the crypto space has been accused of, uh, accused of facilitating in the, back, um, in the past. Uh, so we just know AML and KYC as something to keep your eye on uh, as you enter the space. Thanks, Jose. Um, you know, another area uh, to, to, that is very important in the in the sports space, obviously, is sponsorships and endorsements. Um, and uh, you know, I mentioned that here because we've seen in the last year some some pretty significant. Um, you know, sponsorships go, you know, take some some major left turns. Obviously, FTX is an obvious example. Uh, uh, the Terra stablecoin also collapsed and they had a bunch of sponsorships um, out there. Um, so prior to last year, there was a trend where crypto companies were uh, uh, getting into this space and trying to raise uh, visibility and and um, get exposure to people who are who aren't necessarily in the crypto uh, space already by reaching out to and trying to engage with the sports community through through sponsorships um and you know obviously that has uh slowed down i, I think a lot of properties are very wary right now of doing uh sponsorships with crypto with crypto uh companies but i do think over time uh we'll see that start to turn around as um companies in the space become more substantive right so it's not just a coin or i mean the ftx was it was a different example because there's there's rampant fraud going on there but as you have applications and companies that are that are putting new services and new things out into the world many of which might be integrated with um with games or sports properties or they have activations either on the field or on the tv screen uh i think you know as as those uh, services and applications mature in coming years, sponsorships will, will come back into play. Um, endorsements, you know, similar thing. We're going to talk um, in a little bit about, um, you know, some of the legal restrictions on on endorsements uh, in terms of SEC regulations. Um, very similar to sort of FTC, FTC rules about uh, endorsing uh, products or services. Um, there's, you know, there, there are risks there, but it's it's an area where uh, particularly athletes and celebrities um, can can have some interesting opportunities to do endorsements that involve NFTs, which are different from simply just like an Instagram post, right? Because the concept could involve, you know, an, an NFT that includes not just art but some utility that might be. Uh, you know, access to the celebrity or athlete or um, the right to get uh, autographed merchandise or or other things like that. Uh, so that's another um, area where uh, you have to be uh, think carefully about the way your contracts are structured, right? Um, and there are certain things you can do uh, to protect against some of the the pitfalls that have happened that we've seen in these um, uh, sponsorships that have gone the wrong way. Uh, uh, and obviously, securities laws are one of the hottest and most significant areas here. And Jose is going to start uh, by talking a little bit about the Howey test there. Yeah, uh, the famous Howey test, uh, some of you may or many of you may be familiar. Uh, the Howey test is sort of the traditional legal framework that is applied, uh, that, is, that is being applied to digital assets to determine whether such assets are investment contract securities. 
Uh, it's a four element test. It asks whether there's an investment of money in a common enterprise where there's an expectation of profit to be derived primarily from the efforts of others. Um, uh, what I have to say, what I have to say about Howie, is that it, it might seem like a like a like a simple four element test to apply, but in practice, it, it's much more complicated than that. For each element, there are many factors to consider, uh, which have been driven by court cases, uh, SEC enforcement actions, and and guidelines and other materials as well. Um, and we rely on Howie for NFTs because uh, the, the SEC has not sort of developed or given us a, a separate legal framework for for NFTs. So so we do rely on on Howie um, generally. Uh, I'll pass it to you, Andy, for SEC perspective. Um, yeah. So uh, the the SEC is um, they're looking at NFT projects, right? We 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 know this. Uh, they they. They are bringing enforcement actions in in the crypto space, uh, some many of which involve tokens, um, and uh, they're also they we we know they're looking at NFT projects and evaluating uh, or taking the position that they they constitute um, securities. So when you know if you're going to be launching a project, you do have to be aware, very aware of those rules because uh, it does qualify as a security then you you have an, a legal obligation to either register it with the Securities and Exchange Commission or qualify under an exemption from registration of which of which there are many but the problem is it's 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 a very burdensome uh time consuming and expensive thing to do it opens you up to sort of continuing regulation um and there's a lot of disclosure requirements which i say the problem that's it's also the the benefit of those things right the 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 purpose of these rules is to protect consumers and to make sure that they that they have you know full and and fair and accurate uh, disclosures about investments. The problem becomes the, you know finding the line between is something uh, an investment or is it something that's being sold for some utilitarian or or consumptive purpose. Um, a very recent decision uh, in the sports space uh, that. Uh, just came down within the last, uh, I think it was week last week or the week before, um, was a case in the Southern District of New York involving Dapper Labs and the NBA uh, Top Shots moments. Uh, so this was not a case, interestingly, not a case brought by the, the SEC. This was a case brought by uh, plaintiff's lawyers, a class action case um, asserting uh, civil claims under the securities laws, but basically asserting the same claims that that uh, top shot moments were securities under the Howey test and therefore should have been registered. And there are remedies that the, the Securities and Exchange Act provides where those rules are violated, including uh, rescission and return of all of the money that was spent on, uh, on, the, on the securities in the first place. So um, uh, Dapper Labs, which was the, the partner, um, partnered with the NBA to, to, to put uh, top shots out into the world, which they did by developing their own private blockchain. We talked earlier about the distinction between private and public blockchains. The main issue here being that in order to join this and transact transact on this blockchain, you would have to um, join the the top shots community and Dapper Labs controlled who was able to do that. So it's a it's a private a private blockchain. Um, and they they also had their own token that they created in conjunction with the the blockchain which was known as the flow blockchain and the flow tokens um now the moments top shots are not the only um uh nft or application that could run on the flow blockchain but they were the 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 first um and it was pretty significant at the time when it launched because it was one of the big sort of aha moments of of nfts because of the the the, the popularity of these things and some of them which were basically uh, video clips of, of significant moments from NBA games uh, where people could own the particular moment. Um, and it could have been, uh, depending on how how rare of a moment it, it was in terms of how many instances of it were minted into NFTs, uh, some of those became very valuable and were trading for, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars at a time. So um, Dapper Labs uh, made a motion to get that case dismissed and thrown out of court. Um, and uh, the judge, uh, Judge Marrero in the Southern District of New York, um, 
just on, on February 22nd, um, uh, denied that motion, uh, basically saying that the plaintiff's complaint adequately alleged uh, facts under which it was plausible that, uh, facially plausible that uh, the, the moments constituted securities. Now, important things to keep in mind about this, because there's been a lot of, a lot of coverage on this. Um, we shouldn't jump to conclusions that NFTs are securities all of a sudden. Right, because of this decision. First of all, it's one decision from one court. Um, second of all, it was it was a decision at, at the pleading stage, um, uh, and and in in litigation terms, what that means is if you want to have a case thrown out on a motion to dismiss, the court has to basically read the complaint and take everything that's in the complaint as as true. So they have to assume that everything's true, even though there hasn't been any proof of it yet. So that's what was going on here. The court. The court was just ruling on what was written in the complaint um, and found that it did um, uh, set forth a plausible claim for violation of the securities laws. Now, the court also, though, um, explicitly said that its decision was very narrow, that it was a cl an extremely close call. These are quotes and that it toes the line intimately between something that is and is not a security. So uh, I think this decision, it's actually a very. Uh, comprehensive discussion of of the technology and and the way um, NFT projects work and is and is a, and is a worthy read. But as a as a matter of of precedent, while I'm sure it's going to get a lot of of attention and be relied on a lot, um, it's it's really limited to its facts. Uh, but a couple of things that were significant that are worth um, noting here: the court found it was very significant that. Uh, this project was on a private blockchain. In fact, the court said it was fundamental to the court's decision. So the private nature of the blockchain was important. Um, and that's a factor that can be avoided by launching a project on a public blockchain, such as Polygon or Ethereum or one of the other layer twos that, um, or, or layer ones, frankly, that uh, Jose was talking about earlier. Um, the the court also noted that um, the the use of the proceeds from the sale uh, it was interesting that the court was not persuaded that um, the fact that the the proceeds of sale were not used to build the marketplace, um, that that didn't necessarily mean it wasn't a security because using proceeds to improve, grow, or operate an ecosystem uh, would also be consistent with uh, an item being, being a security. Um, the court uh, just actually found, we think the, the top shots were, were marketed as collectibles, like the equivalent of like video digital trading cards, but the court found that they were really not the equivalent of that. So there is, you know, there is room for maneuverability, um, around this decision for things that really are more like collectibles, like, like trading, like physical trading cards or, or NFTs that are, uh, do more than just allow, uh, the viewing of, of the item, because in this case, the moments really, that was all they did. It was very clear in the terms of service that moments had no inherent value and conveyed no rights to any of the underlying property. And there was little to no utility associated with them at the time that they were sold. So projects that do more than just tie a, uh, an image to an NFT can distinguish themselves from this. Um, uh, finally, there was uh, one thing I found particularly con consist uh, particularly significant or interesting about this decision was that the court said that the existence of a resale royalty alone does not establish the commonality factor uh, necessary to find a security. So um, NFTs, one of the the very disruptive things in the in the creator community about NFTs that made them so popular is that the smart contract for an NFT can um, and and often does include provisions that after the artist sells it, whoever purchased it, if they sell it, again, a portion of that sales price gets paid back to the original artist automatically deposited directly into um, the artist's wallet. Well, the same applies with respect to a project. So Dapper Labs had the equivalent of a resale royalty on moments. So when they were sold um, set in the secondary market, a transaction fee would go back to Dapper Labs. Um, the, the, that's, that's something that the, the SEC has um, uh, talked about or made noise about as being something that is um, indicative of commonality, of the commonality of a, of a security. And the court here, uh, the court here specifically 
did found that not to be a convincing argument, which was uh, an interesting fact. And, and the last thing I'll note here, and this is particularly important for sports properties, uh, the marketing, the language of how you go out and, and talk about your project and promote it pre, during, and after launch is really, really important here. The court focused on, for example, tweets that where the not even just the language of the tweets themselves, but where the tweets included emojis of things like rocket ships and and you know stock stock chart graphs as being suggestive of um, uh, instilling an expectation in purchasers of making a profit. So um, there's a there's a little image on the screen here of the front page of the decision. If anyone is interested in it, I do recommend reading it. Jose. Yeah, thanks, Andy. So there's there's some other uh, cases that uh, touch on traditional cryptocurrencies, not necessarily NFTs, but that we still think are are important to cover just because of the implications. Um, the first of these cases is the SEC versus Library Inc. case uh, filed in the Federal District Court of uh, New Hampshire. Um, uh, the library case is important because it's a recent case applying Howey, and it's also a prime example of uh, the SEC's current, uh, let's call it, aggressive approach towards crypto assets. Uh, in this case, um, the SEC brought suit against Library Inc., uh, the company behind uh, the library platform for conducting uh, an unregistered offering and sale of securities. As some helpful background, because most of you may not be familiar with library, uh, library is a, it's a content platform. It's a... Um, uh, a platform that allows users to share content uh, and publish their own content. And um, the, the the platform had its own native crypto token that was used by users of the platform to access uh, and use the platform. So essentially, they they would buy this library native token and pay, pay in library token to Library Inc. to be able to use the platform. Um, the problem, uh, several of the problems here was uh, first, the founders that used uh, this native token to pay employees and contractors. And uh, generally, they used the token to fund the operations of the platform. Uh, second, the, the founders have made several statements uh, that uh, in the court's interp interpretation could lead uh, potential investors to reasonably expect that the token would grow in value as the company continued to develop the platform. Uh, based on these factors and, and others, I uh, can't cover all of them here, but the, the court concluded that uh, these tokens were investment contract securities because uh, investor had reasonable expectations that they could derive profits from the managerial efforts of others. Uh, in this case, uh, the efforts of the of the founders of Library Inc. And, and therefore, the court determined that all Howey elements were present. Uh, a second case worth noting here is SEC uh, versus uh, Wahi. Uh, it was filed in Seattle. Uh, this case is important for several reasons. First, uh, it implicated a, a major U.S. exchange, Coinbase, uh, without actually naming Coinbase as a defendant. Uh, and, and this sort of raised alarms uh, across the industry. Uh, second, uh, in the SEC's complaint, the SEC focused only on whether the token was centralized in determining whether the token was an investment contract security. And to us uh, as attorneys, this was this was impactful because uh, the SEC seemed to have ignored the possibility that a token could not be a security by virtue of having uh, a comprehensive list of consumptive uses to use within the network. Uh, to us, this was a misrepresentation of Howey, uh, which requires an expectation of profit. Um, we we have historically viewed uh, tokens that have consumptive uses uh, as not being uh, not necessarily being uh, securities. If they have vast, uh, vast consumptive uses uh, within the network, and if um, to add on that, if we we generally did not see tokens as securities, if they were these tokens were being bought for consumptive purposes uh, and not for investment-like purposes, but the court in Wahi seemed to have not touched on this at all, and it only focused on centralization as uh, determinative uh, of whether a token was a securities, and. Um, this again, this was also another case that showed uh, this sort of the SEC's aggressive approach towards towards crypto uh, assets in general. Um, I think that covers uh, Wahi, Andy. I think you're going to cover uh, OpenSea stuff. Yeah, uh, just very briefly, there's uh, there was a, um, a, a an OpenSea employee was was charged um, uh, criminal charges brought against him for insider trading uh, in connection with. Uh, buying and selling NFTs in advance of 
when things were going to be happening on the OpenSea platform. Uh, and the reason I, I, I included it here, there's nothing particularly novel about the, the notion of insider trading, but <clears throat> OpenSea is an NFT platform, right? It's not, <clears throat> excuse me, it's not an exchange that's trading other tokens and things like that. And so, but so in order for the insider trading uh, laws to apply um, to to this case, there have to be securities, and therefore, you know, the the notion that the the Department of Justice, pr presumably informed by the Securities Exchange Commission, uh, brought this case, knowing that we're talking about NFTs, um, and th there's not a, a ton of analysis there, but it was just interesting that they 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 proceeded on the assumption that the NFTs at issue qualify as securities. And I'm, I'm sure that is and will be one of the main defenses uh, of the defendant in that case, right? That these were not securities and therefore these laws don't apply. Um, similarly, recently, um, uh, uh, the basketball player Paul Pierce uh, had an enforcement action brought against him in a cease and desist order issued in connection with um, his endorsement of, of a, a crypto token uh, and, you know, a lot of athletes and, and celebrities are, are doing this because it's kind of a hot area. It's interesting. Um, and it's it's a, a ripe space for, for endorsement deals. But one of the things that was interesting about that was that the token at issue was allegedly a fully decentralized system. Um, and the securities, the SEC, again, this he was charged with violating the anti-touting rules of the SEC, not with the registration. He was not issuing tokens. But there are rules that if you are going to promote, um, if you're getting paid to promote a security, you have to disclose uh, the fact and the amount of the payment. And he didn't do that. Um, and and therefore that's that's what gave rise to, to, to uh, the cease and desist order. Uh, but it was just interesting to note that it was a, a token that was supposedly decentralized, which you know, over the years has been thought to be something that would take it outside of the realm of being a security, such as Bitcoin, which is fully decentralized. Um, uh, Kim Kardashian found herself in a similar uh, uh, situation. Jose, you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so uh, the SEC charges against Kim Kardashian are, are worth noting, again, for the same uh, anti-touting uh, regulations uh issue um although the charges are related to it was related to a traditional cryptocurrency not not nfts um we, we note this because we've seen a crazy influx of celebrities and influencers promoting nft projects um if you spend any any time on on twitter for example and have you know follow any sort of nft accounts you'll see that it's it's non-stop and w we really think it's a it's a matter of time before the sec cracks down on these um NFT influencers and promoters for uh, you know promoting these these projects to the wider investing public without disclosing that they were compensated to do so and like Andy noted how much they were compensated to do so. Okay, so we're going to move on to talk about some in the uh, yeah this is perfect we have about 10 12 minutes left to talk about some of the sports use cases. I, I will say as background to this. You know, there's there's a shift going on in the industry um, uh, from a demographic perspective. I, I you know I read the other day that fans uh, between the ages of 18 and 34 um, are are most most likely to say they prefer watching just highlights as opposed to watching full games across major league major league sports, which is which is a pretty significant um, thing to think about, particularly when you couple it with the fact that you know teenagers and and young adults maybe within that 18 to 25 year old range are now spending a lot more time in digital environments, right? They're watching a lot more of their TV, including sports on their phones or tablets. Um, and a lot of them are spending time in uh, uh, digital, so digital environments that are now, have now become, you know, social places for them to be. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about some of those metaverse things. So the point is, the consuming public's behavior and expectations are changing and the you know the sports properties in the world are going to be uh, adapting in really interesting and exciting ways Jose, you want to talk about ticketing a little bit yeah I'll, I'll talk about ticketing uh the idea of ticketing uh in nfts is similar to the the token gating issue i, I uh, use case that i talked about before for uh, the rolling loud example here for sports we see the possibility uh for example that season tickets could be distributed as nfts where the holder of that NFT has control over those season tickets by virtue of just holding that NFT. 
and then being able to distribute or, or use the tickets to their liking. Uh, in this case, uh, it would be much easier for the holder to uh, send tickets to friends and family for specific games, uh, sell tickets uh, for specific games, uh, all of it being viewable uh, on a public blockchain, which we think is significant. Uh, and and yeah, I think you're going to talk about collectibles. Yeah, and, and we talked a little bit about, about collectibles already in the in the sense of the the Top Shots moments, but they can really be 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 a lot more than that. And um, in many in many ways, we're going to see them being more than that because uh, you know it can be uh, uh, something that is is a, kind of a digital trading card, but it also gives you access to a particular community or um, you know. Uh, exclusive access to a, a meeting online or otherwise with the athlete or entertainer on the card. There's a lot of things that can be attached to that. Um, and then, and, and those, those collectibles can be part of a, part of a community. And also they all live together in a, in a particular wallet, uh, person's wallet that kind of becomes their, um, you know, their, uh, that, that person's, that wallet owner sort of universe of, 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 of collections and affinity. So you can have uh, collectibles, not only for athletes, but for, for brands as well. And, and, and things like we saw Coca-Cola launching a, uh, uh, an NFT that included like a, you know, a bunch of different things, but one of them was like a, uh, a, a digital sort of puffy jacket that you could use and wear in the metaverse. And it also served as a collectible and came with a bunch of of benefits for Coca-Cola. Um, digital goods are another, uh, uh, you know, interesting uh, NFT uh, application where, you know, the, the, and you could have an NFT that corresponds to a, a physical item or, or a good. It could be a, a digital sneaker in an NFT, but it also gives you the right to redeem it for an exclusive, you know, pair of sneakers. We see, um, you know, Nike's uh, 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 collaboration with Artifact is very in interesting and, and one of the bigger NFT projects and big revenue players in that space from a brand perspective. NIL we talked about as well from a collectibles um, perspective. And, and I will say there's also the notion of um, like, like uh, loyalty programs or affinity programs. And, you know, one thing I, I meant to mention at the beginning of the program, I'm glad I mentioned it now, um, you know, these NFTs can also function as just like proof that you were somewhere, that you did something. Um, kind of like how if you if you saved your ticket stub from a concert or a great game, right, you could save your NFT. You have an NFT that represents, um, there's something called a proof of attendance protocol or POAP. Uh, and if you're, if you're at an event, whether it's a game or a concert or even a, a webinar like this, and you have the POAP from that event, it lives in your wallet and you can always prove that you were there. But not only that, the brands that you're interacting with, they they can always see that it's in your wallet and they can follow up with you and have a real direct one to one interaction brand to consumer that in, in the past has always involved some third party, whether it's, you know, Instagram or Facebook or something like that to get to you. Here you have someone who's collecting um you know, sort of your 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 NFTs for particular products or events. Um, so one thing we're going to do here, uh, we did form a PO app uh, for this uh, webinar, and we will send a link uh, uh, to to claim that PO app to everyone who's here. We'll send it to you uh, via email afterwards. And if you don't have have any NFTs, it might be an interesting way for you to say, okay, here's my first NFT. You don't even have to have a crypto wallet if you use the PO app app. You can download it there. If you do have a crypto wallet, you can um, transfer it into there. But that will be something that once you do, it's in your wallet, and it will it will always show that you attended this webinar, which is not that big of a deal, but it gives you an idea of the types of things. If it was, I don't know, if it was like a game, you know, uh, you know, where some some world rec some 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 uh, uh, league record was broken or something. You know, wow, I have the the PO app proving that I was at that game. Uh, so that's another aspect that is interesting there. Um, Jose, you want to talk about esports and gaming? Yeah, uh, blockchain gaming to me, uh, it, it's going to be for the years 2023 and 2024. I think it's going to be the fastest growing subset industry in crypto. Uh, it's blockchain gaming. It's still it's still in its infancy stages, but but we've seen some major developments here in just the last few months, but really the the last year. Uh, including some major gaming studios being open uh, about the fact that they're developing uh, games on blockchain. Um, we think this is going to be a ma massive sector uh, where, you know, 
video game players that have traditionally played just for enjoyment or just due to the fact that they're fans of specific games, uh, these players are going to be able to play those games that they like, but actually earn uh, tangible value in the form of Ethereum, for example, by playing uh, and without having to be professional gamers, which which is the key. Uh, so I, you know, I think blockchain gaming is is, is a key sector to keep uh, keep an eye on moving forward. I think you're muted, Andy. Uh, sorry, another viable area for NFTs is in the uh, world of fantasy sports and sports betting. And you know, we're seeing that we're seeing this um, already uh, in the course of the last months. A company called So Rare uh, has launched uh, fantasy sports programs. With uh, they started with Bundesliga and Premier leagues, but they're also working with uh, MLB, MLS, and and the NBA. Uh, the NBA uh, SoRare program launched in September, and by the end of the year, it had 260,000 players. Um, so, you know, it's pretty it's pretty significant way. Basically, the, there's three million users on SoRare, and they basically they collect collect digital trading cards of players to build a team, and then they can win prizes and awards, um, including like real world things like meet and greets and signed jerseys, as the players on their team succeed in the real world. It's also a way of potentially allowing, you know, trading of uh, players from different sports even. So it's kind of a, a broadening of the, the typical fantasy sports world. Sports betting is is uh, a little bit of a different animal because of all of the local regulation, right? State by state uh, uh, regulation. But the technology of NFTs is is a really interesting, um, uh, has a lot of promise there. Once, once they work out uh, the, the regulatory issues, um, there's another another example where um, actually a you know a client of ours that we've done work for in the past is a company called Karate Combat. It's kind of an MMA uh, league, but but just in the karate space. And they recently announced that they had basically sold their entire league to a decentralized autonomous organization or a DAO, uh, which you may have heard of as well. And they're basically going to run their league um, as a DAO, which means that you know, the fans or whoever hold the, the tokens, the karate tokens, will be um, making decisions. And they can also influence matches and the size of, of match uh, of, of the purses for matches uh, using um, the smart contracts that are part of uh, part of uh, the DAO. And it's it's a it's a more direct way of of picking your favorite fighters and boosting potential prize pools. So um, over time, you know, that DAO will and, and the people who are most active in that DAO will end up controlling the league more and more. So that's another interesting use example. Um, augmented reality is, is a really cool uh, thing as well. In the very simplest, simplest terms, if you think about when you watch a football game, the yellow line showing the first down marker is a form of augmented reality, but it can mean so much more. Um, you can walk around if you're at an event at a brand's event and you scan a QR code or you have one of their NFTs and you're looking around at your with your phone with using the camera, looking at, for example, you know, the bar or the field. And all of a sudden you see on your phone um, a product like I, I did this at, at one event where there was a, you know, the the Johnny Walker, the guy on the Johnny Walker bottle was there when I looked on my phone right in front of me. So it was, it was very interesting. And then. Yesterday, I saw this really unbelievable example, and you can see on the screen here, um, there's a picture of uh, Adam Silver and Ahmad Rashad, and you see Adam Silver is basically, he's, he's walking in a circle around Ahmad Rashad, and there's a picture on the screen of his phone. What he's doing is he's scanning Ahmad, Ahmad Rashad's body, right? And then the picture to the right, he went into another screen where it was the NBA broadcast, and uh, they, they're going to be using this in live broadcast. He was able to choose... Um, to play a player on the court to impose Ahmad Rashad's body into. And he did that uh, choosing um, uh, uh, the, the play Lakers player, Talon Horton Tucker. And basically, it's, it's hard to see because it's a little blurry here, but um, Horton Tucker took the ball. But when you're watching it on TV, it was Ahmad Rashad, ran down the court and dunked it. And you know, it was literally, a, a, I mean, it was a little bit of a computerized version of a modern shot, um, but it was very cool technology. If you get a chance to watch it, um, it, it was a very, it was really cool and a good way to, that to, it'll just give you a, a, a sense of how, uh, how this can change things. Um, we're running out of time, but the metaverse is a very 
uh, also someplace that I think it's going to slow. It's you know the investment there and use is slowing down a little bit with everything that's going on um, in the in the crypto world. But um, places like the important thing is that places like these metaverses like Roblox and Fortnite, they're not just gaming platforms now. They've become social environments where where people, particularly young people, are spending a lot of their time, getting a lot of their information, and doing a lot of their interaction. Um, and it's a really hot area for for brands. Um, to expand and reach new customers and interact with them in different ways, including in the sports world. And the, the notion of, of games and um, uh, things being played in, in the games for, for consumers to compete with each other, but also virtual attendance at, at real life events is something that I think we're going to start seeing as properties start building out metaverse versions of, of their, their IRL or in real life um, um, locations. Um, finally, digital identity. Uh, we talked a little bit about this, but one of the probably most disruptive uh, things about blockchain technology and NFTs is that it basically puts uh, ownership of, of your data right, of, uh, back into the hands of, of the consumer. So um, imagine uh, it, it gives the users control over their data, which makes first party data rights and transactions kind of the future in online advertising as opposed to the way we all have our data sort of, you know, mined and so, well, maybe not all of us, some people try to go off the grid, but you know, when you're, when you're on Facebook or Instagram or whatever your platform is, even Twitter, and you start seeing ads for something um, that you were thinking about or talking about or looking at the day before, it's because, you know, your, your data is, is being mined and being used by advertisers and platforms. There's a future in which, your data is is controlled by your own NFT, your unique digital identity NFT. And if a brand or advertiser wants to, to have your data, they can interact with your NFT and they can get your data, but they have to pay you for it, right? As opposed to the other way around, which is kind of what we do now, right? We pay to, to use these platforms and to see things. Um, and we're really not only paying with our with our money, but with our time and attention. And there's a real, a real disruptive possibility here of that dynamic sort of turning on its head uh, in the coming years uh, because of, of the whole notion of, of digital identity. Um, uh, we're moving a little quickly and kind of at time now. I think we we had a couple of questions. Jose, unless there's anything that I that I missed. Questions. Um, I think we one question. A, go, yeah. go ahead. No, yeah, we had one question about um, Court decisions evalu evaluating breach of contract claims in this space relating to the enforceability of a smart contract versus a standard written contract covering the same subject matter. There are, I know there are some some cases, uh, uh, breach contract cases um, in this space, but you know my my perspective on this, I haven't really seen anything where. You know, the smart contract itself typically is not the same as a legal contract, right? A smart contract is a computer program um, and it, it's self-executing and it, and it does things. It's like it's like when I swipe my credit card at the, you know, at the store, um, you know, I am I am basically offering to purchase something and closing a purchase. But it's it's a self-executing thing. So it's not really something that that can be can be breached. Um, and it's it's self-enforcing. Now, ultimately, they'll have to be. If there are disputes, the smart contracts will have to be audited. Now, and where I think the disputes will come will be where someone says, "Hey, I've got the, here's this NFT, and the smart contract is going to do X." But in reality, the smart contract is written in a way either that has a bug in it, or it's intentionally written not to do X but to do Y, right? And the only way to guard against that is going to be to audit the smart contract and really and really understand it. Uh, so I'm not aware of that, of, of decisions in that nature uh, uh, coming out yet, but I wouldn't be surprised if we start to see them soon. Um, uh, any movement on the Nike case? I think you're talking about the Nike and uh, what is it, StockX case? You're familiar with that one, Jose? Um, I haven't seen any sort of any recent developments there. Yeah, I think that case is still is still pending. Um, so I'm not I'm not aware of any decisions, but that's a case where um, uh, a, a an NFT project was basically creating digital versions of 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 Nike shoes that are that were tied to physical um, editions of those shoes that they had, and then they were you know allowing those 
NFTs to trade online. And Nike said, well, you're basically um, similar to the Hermes notion. You're basically trading off of our, our brand and trademark and trade dress. Uh, but no, I, I haven't heard uh, of any decisions in that case yet. Um, so any other questions? Let's see, we're a little after time here. I think that's it. Uh, okay, well, I appreciate everyone's attendance and, and for bearing with us and our, our very fast speaking because there's a lot, a lot to cover. Um, and uh, like I said, we, we will follow up with the with the PO app NFT. So anyone who's interested in seeing how that works, um, when we send you an email, please do uh, please do check it out. Um, nothing particularly special about it. It's just an example of how one uh, basic piece of this technology works. So from all of us at Foley and Lardner, uh, and myself and Jose, we really appreciate your time. Uh, you can uh, find us um, if you want to scan this code or. That will take us to our website, but you can also get in touch with me. My email is andylee at foley.com. I'll put it in the chat here. And Jose is jlazaro um, at foley.com. So thanks again, and uh, we appreciate your time. Thank you all. Have a good one.